We welcome you all, both online and in person, on this rainy fall day. It's been a beautiful weekend so far. Yesterday was, was really pretty. If you'd stand and we'll have our uh, responsive reading. <clears throat> o Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When we consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set in place, what is humanity that you are mindful of them? Little children, that you care for them. From the lips of children and infants, you have ordained praise. We have been crowned with honor and clothed in glory. We have been made the ruler of God's works. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We'll now sing uh, in the supplement 1021, How Great Thou Art. Oh. 
join me in prayer. O oh God, in the past you spoke to our forefathers through the prophets and in various ways, but in these last days you have spoken to us through your Son, through whom you made the universe. Jesus, you are the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of God's being, sustaining all things by your powerful word. Thank you for providing purification for sins. We honor you now, majesty in heaven. Speak to us, cleanse us, heal us, renew us today, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may sit down. Psalm 8 reminds us that in the midst of God's grand creation, he cares for each person. As we give today, let us worship God for his care for all people. Our special offering for this month is Hope House, a shelter and support for homeless and addicted people located in Richmond, Indiana. You may give your regular offering in the offering plate and your special offering for Hope House in the service cup at the back. You can also give to either offering through Tidely, uh, the app on our website, metalcreek.org. I'll be reading from Genesis 31, 41 to 55. Come now, let's make a covenant, you and I, and let it serve as a witness between us. So Jacob took a stone and set it up as a pillar. He said to his relatives, gather some stones. So they took stones and piled them in a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Laban called it Jagar Sadutha, and Jacob called it Gilead. Laban said, this, this heap is a witness between you and me today. That is why it was called Galeed. It was also called Mizpah, because he said, may the Lord keep watch between you and me when we are away from each other. If you mistreat my daughters, or if you take my wives besides my daughters, even though no one is with us, remember that God is a witness between you and me. Laban also said to Jacob, here is this heap, and here is this pillar. I have set up between you and me. This heap is a witness, and this pillar is a witness that I will not go past this heap to your side to harm you, and that you will not go past this heap and pillar to my side to harm me. May God, the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob took an oath in the name of the fear of his father Isaac. He offered a sacrifice there in the hill country and invited his relatives to a meal. After they had eaten, they spent the night there. Early the next morning, Laban kissed his grandchildren and his daughters and blessed them. Then he left and returned home. Thank you, Jody. I know you always enjoy reading all those names. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, Marjorie and Sally, with our music. <clears throat> Since this is World Communion Sunday, I'm going to share this with you today. One Communion Sunday, the communion steward prepared an unusual communion. When it came time to uncover the elements, the grape juice looked darker than usual. The minister thought nothing of it, began to serve the communion. Promptly upon receiving the cup, each recipient's face took a stunned look. When it came time for the pastor to receive, he discovered the reason for the strange looks. The juice was prune juice. And one parishioner stated, perhaps this is a divine commentary on our spiritual lives. We need a little loosening up. <laughs> I didn't put prune juice in there for you today, so, but welcome, and we're going to talk about communion today. We're also going to talk about covenant today and how they go together, but have, has anybody, this thought came to me reading the scripture today, 
Has anybody ever said or heard a phrase like this? God as my witness, or with God as my witness, or God is my witness. Usually we say that to try to verify what maybe someone else thinks isn't verifiable. Or they might be questioning us, and then we say that to say, okay, I'm telling the truth. God is my witness, or with God is my witness. Or we might think about that uh, idea in the courtroom, putting your hand on the Bible and holding up your other hand, either with an oath or an affirmation. And so today, uh, that thought came to me as we're looking at this, because we are looking at a covenant that's made with God as the witness of this covenant. Now, this is a human-to-human -human covenant that we're going to look at in Genesis 31. But I'm going to take the principles of that and look at how that fits for us today in a few options that we have as current modern-day covenants, including our covenant with God. So I'm going to take a little time in Genesis 31 to explain the pieces of covenant because covenant is really important to the Bible. In fact, I have said two things throughout this series, and I'm going to make my second point today. But the first one is you can't really understand the rest of the Bible, especially New Testament, without understanding Genesis. Genesis is so important to understanding the rest of the Bible in New Testament. Without it, it just doesn't make sense. The other thing that is critical, important to understanding the Bible and the New Testament is this word covenant. In fact, the very word testament means covenant. So if we're looking at the Old Testament, that is the Old Covenant or the First Covenant, and then we have the New Testament, which is the New Covenant. Now, there are actually several covenants in the Bible, and we're looking at one of those today between two people. But when we say old and new, what we're really referring to is the one was the first covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who became Israel and the people of Israel. So everything in the, what we call the Old Covenant was God's covenant with the people of Israel. And if you think about it in those terms, the first five books of the Bible are the Law of Moses. And those first five books of the Bible are the terms of the covenant. Obviously, some of it comes in narrative form, but a lot of it is law. And a lot of us look at those and we say, why is there so many laws in the Old Testament? And what does that have to do with me? Well, part of that means this is the covenant that God established with his people, Israel. And God had his side of the covenant and Israel had their side of the covenant. And then the rest of the Old Testament is commentary on that. How well did they keep that covenant? Who kept it well? Who didn't keep it well? What were the blessings for keeping it? What were the judgments for breaking it? And then if you look into the prophets, the prophets were always sent to call Israel back to the covenant. Saying, Israel, you are getting away from this. You are breaking it. Judgment will come because of you breaking this covenant. Now repent, turn your heart back, and live according to the covenant. But even in the midst of that, God had some words to teach them about what was to come. Because even in the midst of that first covenant or that old covenant with the nation of Israel, that was not going to be God's final covenant. In fact, the prophets also proclaimed, you can't keep this covenant. And that's why we need a new one. So if you look at Jeremiah, for example, 31, 31 to 35, this is one of the Old Testament prophets. And he's commenting on there's a new covenant coming. If you see 31, 31, the time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, 32. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. 33, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people, 34. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their sins, their wickedness, and remember their sins no more. 
35, this is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by the day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name. And that last line is to confirm, yes, this God is going to make this new covenant. But I want to go back to verse 32 for a minute here. If you can pull that back up. Go back to verse 32. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. Though I was a husband of them. God is saying, I was faithful on my end. But Israel wasn't. They broke my covenant. And that's why I need to make a new covenant. And that's why in verse 34, if you pull that back up. Verse 34. Uh, 33, sorry. It says, I will be their God and they will be my people. Next slide. Okay, it is. Yeah, at the bottom. Okay, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. So the heart of the new covenant was going to be a forgiveness because they broke his covenant. And there's other parts of that new covenant that he was going to make. Putting the law in the heart, putting the law in the mind. In other words, bringing the Holy Spirit of God himself to dwell inside of us because we can't do it on our own. Lest we be uh, haughty toward the Israelites, we would put ourselves in the same category. We too can't keep the covenant of God. We too, if we are honest, have broken God's ways and sinned against God. So none of us can say we have kept the covenant on our side. So I want you to see that there is an old covenant and there is a new covenant. And the old covenant, the first covenant, was the first covenant that God made, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, who became Israel and the nation of Israel. The Old Testament or the laws, the first five books of the Bible, are the covenant that God made with them. Then you have the commentary, then you have the prophets who are calling them back and also saying, but because you've broken it and you can't keep it, there's a new covenant coming. And the new covenant is what we experience today through the blood of Jesus. But covenant is something that's hard for us to understand in our current culture. We are not very covenant-minded in this culture today. But in the culture of Genesis, they were very covenant-minded. And that's why it was kind of second nature to them. It was part of their culture, but it isn't to us. So in order for us to understand covenant better, I want us to look at this story in Genesis 31 and help us to understand what covenants are even all about. So a covenant, what is a covenant? That's what we're going to look at here. We're going to see it through this story between Jacob and Laban. A covenant, first, is an oath-bound agreement. A covenant is a binding oath. Putting your own life on the line. It's putting your own life on the line to keep that covenant. It's very strong. And a lot of times when we think of agreements in our world today, or contracts in our world today, we don't think about them being so strong. We break contracts or we break agreements. We break our word. We break our bond without much repercussion. But a covenant was putting your life on the line for breaking it. It was very strong. This was not a weak contract. Obviously, a covenant always involves at least two parties. There has to be more than one involved. Each side makes an oath. And so they are saying, I'll put my life on the line to keep this side of the covenant. Now, in this case, this is not a good covenant. <laughs> this is not a positive covenant. And even the words that we have taken out of this and say in our end of our deacon meetings, the original context of it is not positive. It's actually a negative one, like God is going to watch to make sure you keep this covenant. Because I don't trust you. This whole covenant is based on a lack of trust. These two people do not trust each other. Laban does not trust Jacob. Jacob does not trust Laban. They are both deceivers. They have both done wrong against each other. And now they're at a point where they are making a covenant because they want to make sure the other does no longer does bad to each other. This is not a good covenant. This is, in a way, almost like a divorce covenant. <laughs> All right? We're putting up our boundary. You stay on that side, I'll stay on this side. There will be no crossing. And if we do, 
or if we harm each other, then there's going to be trouble. This covenant. So let's look back what led to this covenant. Why do they need this? Back to Genesis 31, 17. I ended with this last week. 17 and 18 of Genesis 31. Jacob put his children and his wives on camels, and he drove all of his livestock ahead of him, along with all the goods he had accumulated in Padan Aram, to go to his father Isaac into the land of Canaan. So Jacob and his wives and his children and all that he got from when he was there with Laban, he says, we're out of here. So he begins to leave, and then Laban is told that they've left, and he gets after them. He tries to find them. He realizes his household gods have been stolen. He accuses Jacob of taking them. Jacob doesn't know they've been taken, but Rachel took them, and Rachel hides them, and she doesn't show them. And then Rachel, uh, verse 35, she talks about, I, I, I can't show you... Uh, I can't get up right now. She's hiding the gods. 36, Jacob was angry and took Laban to task. What is my crime? He asked Laban. This is Genesis 31, 36. What sin have I committed that you hunt me down? Now you search through all my goods, and what have you found that belongs to your household? Put it here in front of your relatives and mine and let them judge between the two of us. And now he goes into his commentary, verse 38. I have been with you for 20 years now. Your sheep and goats have not miscarried, nor have I eaten rams from your flocks. I did not bring you animals torn by wild beasts. I bore the loss myself, and you demanded payment from me for whatever was stolen by day or by night. This was my situation. The heat consumed me in the daytime, the cold at night, and sleep fled from my eyes. It was like this for the 20 years I was in your household. I worked for you for 14 years for your two daughters and six years for your flocks, and you changed my wages 10 times. So Jacob's unloading on Laban like, you've been bad to me. It's been really hard 20 years, and I'm ready to leave. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would have surely sent me away empty-handed. But God has seen my hardship and the toil of my hands, and last night he rebuked you. Because during the night, Laban was told by God, don't say anything good or bad toward Jacob. So Laban answered Jacob, well, the women are my daughters. The children are my children. The flocks are my flocks. All you see is mine. So he's saying, everything you got, Jacob, was because of me. Don't act like you didn't get anything. Or about the children they have born. Verse 44, come now. Let's make a covenant, you and I, and let it serve as a witness between us. So Laban suggests this, like, we obviously have some issues to deal with, so let's resolve it with a covenant. So Jacob took a stone, set it up as a pillar, and he said to his relatives, gather some stones. So they took stones and piled them in a heap, and they ate there by the heap. So number two point here on what is a covenant. Covenants have objects that serve as symbols of remembrance of the witness or the testimony. We often rely on words, and I'm not saying the old covenant didn't, because obviously you have five books of writing, right? But they also used objects on a regular basis to symbolize their covenant that they had. The object was the reminder of the agreement. So they started with a stone and set it up as a pillar, and then he said, gather some stones, and they took stones and piled them there in a heap. And verse 47, Laban called it Jager Sadutha, which means witness heap in his language. And Jacob called it Galid, which means witness heap in Hebrew. And then Laban said in verse 48, this heap is a witness between you and me today. So the objects are the witness for the covenant. So a covenant is an oath-bound agreement, putting your life on the line, and the objects serve as the reminder or the statement that we have made this covenant. When both people look at the object, they know that that has been made. So here it's the stones, it's the heap, it's the pillars, and they had a name for it. Now, 
The next part here. Covenants are established through eating a meal together. In other words, eating the meal was the agreement to the covenant. We look back again. It says in verse uh, 46, he said to his relatives, gather some stones. They took the stones, piled them in a heap, and they ate there by the heap. Verse 54, it says, he offered a sacrifice there in the hill country and invited his relatives to a meal. After they had eaten, they spent the night there. The meal is, I agree to the covenant. So the covenant is an oath-bound agreement. The covenant has an object to serve as a witness to it. And then the covenant is established through both sides partaking of the meal together. Another part of this. Covenants are either established by God, like God with Abraham, God with Isaac, God with Jacob. God was making a covenant with them. Or in the case of human-to-human -human covenants, with God as the witness. Human, human, but God is in the middle of it, being the witness of the covenant. 48, 31, 48, Laban said, this heap is a witness between you and me. Now you see he uses that language of this heap as a witness. But then in verse 49, he says it was also called Mizpah. Now, Galid meant the witness heap, but Mizpah meant watchtower. Why was it a watchtower? Because he said, may the Lord keep watch between you and me when we are away from each other. In other words, God's the witness of the covenant. You can go away from me, but you can't go away from God. God's watching to make sure you keep this covenant. And then verse 50, if you mistreat any of my daughters, or if you take any wives besides my daughters, even though no one is with us, remember, God is a witness between you and me. So God is serving as the witness in their human-to-human -human covenant. 53 to 54, may the God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, the God of their father, judge between us. So Jacob took an oath in the name of the fear of his father, Isaac. 54, he offered a sacrifice there in the hill country. Obviously, the sacrifice was to the Lord. So all of this shows us that the covenant, this covenant is not established by God, but it's God as the witness. That's where I got this title. God as my witness, or with God as my witness. God is my witness. God's the witness of this covenant made between these two people, which makes it stronger because they're saying, now, God is the one that we have to answer to, not just the other person. I'm not just answering to you, Laban, or answering to you, Jacob. I'm also answering to God for how I keep this covenant or don't keep this covenant. Finally, covenants establish consequences, both positive, known as blessings, for keeping the covenant, and negative, known as curses, for breaking the covenant. So this one mostly focuses on the negative. Look at verse 50 again. If you mistreat any of my daughters, or if you take any of my wives besides my daughters, even though no one is with us, remember God is a witness between you and me. In other words, things are going to go bad for you if you do this, if you break this covenant. And then again, before, they talked about that God is the witness of this. I won't go past this stone. I won't go past this stone. God's the witness of this. It's mostly written in a negative form. This one's not really written in the positive form. Well, you'll get these blessings if you keep it. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to recap all these points about what a covenant is, and then we're going to switch and look at what does this mean for us today. Okay? We're not Jacob. We're not Laban, right? Now, if you were in the Old Testament, if you were a descendant of Jacob, this pertained to you because the witness heap was there, the stone was there, and you were still not supposed to cross that and mess with the descendants of Laban. 
But we're not directly in that line. And we're not worried about crossing this boundary line. But I want you to see here the principles of covenant that we learn and then translate this into some covenants we have today. So covenant, oath-bound agreement, your life on the line. They have an object or multiple objects sometimes that serve as symbols of the testimony. They are established through eating a meal together. That's how you accept it. And they're established by God or in the name of God with God as a witness. And they establish both positive and negative for keeping or breaking. And I believe there's three major covenants that we need to consider in our world today. The first one is marriage. Because I believe marriage is the top human to human that we have today. If we think about human covenants, and again, a lot of our people have gotten away from thinking about marriage as this type of covenant. But when we think about marriage, we're actually making a covenant. Not just like a legal contract or something like that. And it should be a positive one, not a negative one, right? <laughs> we shouldn't enter into a marriage covenant and say, okay, this is the line. <laughs> you don't cross it, and I won't cross it. This is your side of the house. This is your side of the bed. This is your side of the room. You stay on your side. I'll stay on mine. But marriage covenant is all this together, right? It's an oath-bound agreement. When you stand at the altar, or whatever you call it, you are making an oath-bound agreement. They have an object, right? The exchanging of the rings is the object. And that's what serves as the symbol. When I wear this ring, I have the symbol on my hand of my keeping of the covenant. Yes, there was vows made, but I don't carry around my vows with me. That wouldn't be a bad thing necessarily. But that's not what I keep with me. I keep the symbol of the vows with me. And that's the object to remember the covenant. Covenants are established through eating a meal together. Now, we don't necessarily have that as part of our ceremony, but we often still include some sort of reception, some sort of meal afterwards. It still has that feel of being part of the celebration. But really, our accepting of it is the I do. Instead of taking food, we usually just say I do. Now, Karen and I and others have done this too. They've had communion in the middle of their service. But that's what we get to the next part, right? Established by God or with God as a witness. And really, we have human witnesses when we have a covenant ceremony of marriage. But also, the reason that you would bring the pastor in or the reason you'd bring the spiritual leader in is to say, God is the witness of this. God's the witness of this marriage. Obviously, there's human witnesses as well. And then, covenants establish consequences, positive and negative, for keeping and for breaking. So there's negative consequences, obviously, when we break our covenant with our spouse positive ones if we keep them. So I want you to see here the highest level of human to human relationship we have is a marriage covenant, but this idea of covenant has been lost in our culture by a lot of people. We don't think of marriage as this type of a covenant anymore. But that's the type of level that I believe biblically a marriage covenant is to be, which is why I think it's so important. And why I think Jesus puts such a high priority on that. Secondly now, I'm going to transition this to our covenant with God through the blood of Jesus. This is one that's established by God. This is not necessarily like me and another human. This is me and God. This is similar to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, getting God and having a covenant with us. And I'm going to put three and two together because I want to talk about this together. I think it's just going to be easier to flow, even though technically they're different. Our covenant with God's people, the church. Now, our covenant with God's people, the church, again, a lot of us don't think in that terms. A lot of us don't think I'm in covenant with God's people. 
And we think of church not as a covenant, but a place I attend if I want to. But a church is actually a covenant agreement. Saying, I'm covenanting into the body of Christ with the people of God. So let's go back and look at both of these with our covenant with the blood of Jesus and our covenant with God's people, the church. What is a covenant again? It's an oath-bound agreement. So what did Jesus do in his last night? He made an oath-bound agreement from God and said, I am making this new covenant with God's people. Covenants have an object or multiple objects that serve as symbols of remembrance. What do we take on a regular basis? We take, this is my body, broken for you. This is my blood, shed for you. That's the object, that's the symbol of remembrance of the testimony. And every time we take it, we are remembering the covenant that we have with God through the body and the blood of Jesus. And Jesus offered that on his end. And covenants are established by eating a meal. So when we eat, we are saying yes. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons I still think, if you look in the New Testament, if you really see the context, Jesus made that covenant in the context of the Passover meal. In Corinthians, it looks pretty clear that they remembered the covenant in the context of a meal. I know we're not doing the full meal today, but this is one of my advocacies for love feast. Why in the context of a meal is this important? Because the Old Testament understanding of covenant and Jesus when he established it in the early church when they did it, they had in the context of a meal. Acts 2, it talks about how they met for the breaking of bread and they met in each other's homes to eat together. I think that's the reason because it was the breaking of bread was, yes, eating a meal, but it was also partaking of communion. Covenants are established either by God or in the name of God with God as witness. The new covenant was established by God through Jesus to us. The second half is what we do with the church. We are entering into a covenant with other people with God as the witness. Covenants establish consequences, both positive and negative. Now, the New Testament is a wonderful covenant because it's based on grace and faith. But we still have an aspect to play. We still have to put our faith in Jesus to receive the benefits of the covenant. If we don't, then we receive the curses for the breaking of the covenant. Remember, he will forgive our wickedness. He will cleanse our sins. But if we don't put our faith in Jesus, we can't receive that benefit of it. Instead, we'll look at the cursing side for the breaking of it. So our covenant with God is through the blood of Jesus, and our covenant with God's people, the church, because of the blood of Jesus, with God and others, serves as a witness. And ideally, communion does both. It serves as a witness and a remembrance of our covenant with God through Jesus. It also serves as a witness and a testimony of our covenant with each other with God as witness. And that's one of the reasons I think that the love feast is such a great opportunity to do both. Because it's not just an isolated Event. It's not just you and the bread and the cup. It's you and the bread and the cup and a meal and feet washing and God's people. You say, well, where does the feet washing fit in? I think that's one more symbol that God has given us as a remembrance. Not just the bread and the cup. Because if you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all talk about the bread and the cup. If you look at John, he doesn't. John chapter 13 begins the same meal. But instead of the bread and the cup, he washes feet. And then he says these words. He says, 
to do this. And you are blessed if you do this. I believe that was Jesus saying this is another symbol, another way of remembering my cleansing of your sin. Yes, we often think about the servant side and the washing of other feet side, but if you look at the receiving side, why do we receive feet washing? It's not just so someone can have a foot to wash. <laughs> you need to be a servant, so someone needs to be served. Here's my foot. I believe it's a reminder of the cleansing that we have in Jesus. Jesus told Peter, if you've had a bath, you just need your feet washed. In other words, what would be the bath? The bath would be our initial cleansing. And I believe that's symbolized through baptism. And baptism is our symbol of saying yes to Jesus and yes to the community of faith, yes to Jesus, and yes to the church. So I'm going to go back to Jeremiah 31 where I began. I want to end with this today. We should get ready for communion today. Let's go back to Jeremiah 31. The time is coming, declares the Lord. I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And we live on the new covenant side. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant. In other words, it's not going to be the covenant of law. 33. This is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after that time. I'll put my law in their minds. I will write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. 34. No longer will man teach his neighbor or man his brother saying, Know the Lord. They will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. And we'll end on that one today. 1 Corinthians 11 talks about taking some time to prepare to take communion. Because it says, don't come in an unworthy manner. And I think too often we have equated unworthy manner with us being worthy. <laughs> Taking the King James unworthily as if we're the people who are unworthy. But that's the starting point. The starting point is saying I'm unworthy. If we think we're worthy, maybe then we need to repent and realize we're not. We start by saying, I'm not worthy. That's why we need forgiveness. That's why we need our wickedness to be removed. Because we're unworthy. Because we've broken the covenant. But then we come and say, Jesus, you haven't broken yours on your end. Your blood is solid. Your blood says, I'm forgiven. And I need that forgiveness unworthily or unworthy man or unworthy way is to come without reverence, to come without faith, to come not believing in the covenant, or to come in a way that dishonors the rest of the people, which was really the point in 1 Corinthians 11 because it was a meal setting. Some people were coming and drinking so much wine they were getting drunk. And some people weren't getting any wine. That's why I think it was real wine. Never seen people say, oh man, drunk from that Welch's grape juice. <laughs> some were getting drunk. Some were gorging themselves and eating and then others were getting nothing. That was an unworthy way. Because some people were being left out. And the body was not being honored. Your covenant with everyone else was not being honored. So today, I ask that you take a few moments to prepare your heart. We're going to take a minute or two of silence here to prepare our hearts. Recognize our unworthiness. Confess our sins to the Lord. And then receive by grace and through faith. And if you're watching online, I encourage you, if you do have bread, if you do have cup ready. If not, you can, if you're watching later, pause it and go ahead and get it. And then take a few moments to prepare your heart right now and receive this bread and cup and receive these symbols. So let's take a moment now to prepare our hearts.
God, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We admit that we're sinners. We admit that on our own we have broken your covenant. We have done things that have been against you and your will for our lives. And we thank you for the blood of Jesus. And that in the book of Matthew, he said that this is the blood of the covenant. And it's for the forgiveness of sins. And we thank you that we are forgiven today because of the blood. That you keep your covenant. It's not like the old covenant. It's not like the law where we have to keep it good enough. But we thank you that instead it's based on grace and through faith. That you did it for us. We receive that blessing and receive that benefit that we are righteous today. We want to receive this now in a worthy manner, a way that honors you, in a way that honors the covenant we have with you and the covenant we have with the people here in this room and those connecting online, the church of Jesus Christ. And God, I pray today that you will bless this bread, bless this cup now as we partake in it. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we have a saying that we're going to say together. It's a, it's a blessing. Um, Church of the Brethren has always said we have the priesthood of all believers. So the pastor alone doesn't need to bless the bread and cup, but we all get to. So these are sayings, if you want to put them up there, Brad, on the um, bread and the cup. So we'll say both together, <laughs> and then we'll go row by row. You can partake of the Take the, take the bread and take the cup. Partake of it wherever you feel comfortable, wherever it's helpful for you. You can even kneel over here if you'd like or go back to your seat or stand. And then uh, just go ahead and take the cup to the back and put it in the container back there. So let's bless this together. The bread which we break is the communion with the body of Christ. The cup which we bless is the communion with the blood of Christ.
So for those of you who are joining us online, that was our chance to partake in communion. I hope you had the opportunity to do so as well. It's a great blessing to be able to partake of those symbols and realize we have a covenant with God through the blood of Jesus and the forgiveness of our sins and righteousness with God. The blessing of being covenant with God and each other. So we're going to close out today with singing together from our hymnal supplement. Number 1116, I will sing the wondrous story. Let's stand together. your covenant with God through the blood of Jesus Christ.